Ron Chu is an historian, journalist, cultural leader, and lifelong Seattleite. He is principal of Chu Communications, where he pursues his lifelong passion for documenting, lo documenting local community history through oral history and multimedia projects. He's been editor of the International Examiner and is executive editor of the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience. In that last role, Ron helped redefine museums, what they can do, what they're for, by melding cultural identity, civic participation, and programming into a new tool in the fight for social justice. He is a recipient of the Ford Foundation's Leadership for a Changing World Award and an honoree of the Association of American Museums Centennial Honor Roll. His first book, Reflections of Seattle's Chinese Americans, The First 100 Years, was published back in 1995 and features intimate stories and portraits of elders in Seattle's Chinese American community. Remembering Silne Domingo and Jean Viernes, The Legacy of Filipino American Labor Activism was published in 2012 and examines the lives of two slain cannery union reformers through memories of their families and friends. Naomi Ishisaka is the social justice columnist for the Seattle Times. A journalist and photographer who focuses on racial equity and social justice, her work has appeared in the Seattle Times, Seattle Magazine, City Arts, South Seattle Emerald, and many other publications. Her writing and photography captures social justice movements, issues and events, and her accounting of the Black Lives Matter movement is featured in a number of shows and galleries, as well as in Ava DuVernay's documentary film, 13th. Ron Chu's book, My Unforgotten Seattle, is the topic of their discussion this evening. If you scanned our calendar this year, you know that our digital season has been distinguished by some pretty extraordinary conversations, none more so than tonight. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Ishisaka and Ron Chu. Hello, welcome everyone. It's so good to see some familiar faces in the in the chat. Um, you, I guess, you've already figured out how that part works, so that's great. Um, we love to see you in there. Um, and oh, I guess it's disabled, but you can put your questions in the ask a question button um, on the bottom of your screen, and I'll get to those toward the end of the conversation. But um, it's really great to be here. Um, it was such a pleasure to read. Your book, Ron. Um, I, you know, I, I told you that it, it was like so many of the threads of my life that kind of were finally woven together into a, into a piece of fabric that I could actually comprehend, which um, was really wonderful to see. There were um, so many aspects of it that touched on, you know, my, my family, my life, um, my career, and you know, just there were a lot of parallels to the things that I've experienced, but. Um, I only knew some like little bits and pieces of a lot of the things growing up. And so reading this book really helped kind of put all those pieces together in a way that um, was I really treasured. So thank you so much. It was really compelling and um, definitely a piece of history that everyone should should be able to be a part of. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Uh, that was, I mean, from what you said, that actually means that I was successful because my goal in writing the book was really to present and pull together threads of uh, the lives of people I knew from my generation and then to share that as some kind of cohesive whole in looking back uh, so that the generation that follows, which is your generation, my kids' generation, uh, can make sense of what came before. Them. Yeah. Um, to that point, one of the one of the quotes that really stuck mm -hmm. out for me um, from the book was the one toward the beginning of, of the book, which said, um, our history is built on the precarious foundation of what is remembered, acknowledged and disclosed. And to me, that just spoke to so much of the work that you've done um, as a journalist and as a museum director and in keeping these kinds of community stories alive. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and why that's important to your work? Well, in in writing this huge book, which turned out to, by the way, to be much bigger of an animal than I originally envisioned, it's a 700 page book with lots of pictures um, to break up the text. Um, you know, I was really trying to um, um, sort of figure out the strands of how my life came together. And it really was at the core of my interest in, in people's stories and becoming a writer, becoming a journalist. So I think all along the way, um, I have a funny way of, my mind works in sort of a, I think a journalist kind of frame all the time. So I'm always 
almost in a sense, taking notes in my brain and filing things away. Things that uh, uh, impact me, really impact me, and they stick in my brain. And so over the years, you know, starting with the dream of being a journalist and eventually working um, as a community journalist for many years, I started accumulating stuff. And so um, I said, let's, let's pull all these things together and uh, uh, see um, what I can share that might be of some value. Uh, as journalists, and you know Naomi, uh, a lot of your work as a writer is really very intentional. Uh, it's about um, snapshotting things that uh, might otherwise not be uh, acknowledged to even have happened. And so the extent to which I can help fill some gaps uh, gives a sense of accomplishment that you've done something about you. You touched on this a little bit already, but um, could you just talk about a little bit about the process of putting this book together? I mean, it, for those who haven't read it, it's it's quite epic. I mean, what's the first date that's mentioned? Probably eighteen, early eighteen hundreds, right. right? To right. to March of this year, or actually May of this year. Um, yeah. Can you talk about how you how you did that and what the process was and um, how you when you when you even started thinking about doing this? Yeah, uh, you know, I the book the seed of the idea to do a memoir happened about a year after the murder of uh, a good friend of mine, Donnie Chin, uh, a medic in the Chinatown National District for many years. Uh, 2015 July, uh, he was murdered uh killed in a crossfire between two rival gangs um about a year after his murder uh, there were a series of uh other um deaths of folks of um the generation preceding me um uh, folks like charles e smith bob santos uh, ruth Wu, many others they seemed to all the span of two years, a whole uh, series of folks had passed away. And so with Bonnie's unresolved murder, uh, and then these deaths lingering over me, I decided uh, I should do a memoir. I should write about these people and the change they helped create in Seattle. And so that got me looking at my own life, which extends um, pretty far back. I started researching my family tree. Uh, my grandfather came in 1911 to Seattle uh, and settled. Um, and I think often, uh, with especially within communities of color, you don't have a real strong sense of where your place is. Because a lot of it is also the exclusion laws and um, you know, who is legal and who's not legal. Um, but I, was, I persevered, I pieced together, did immigration research, went back to China, visiting my father's village. Um, so I traced things as far back as I could uh, and then began to uh, reflect on um, what pieces of my life uh, somehow connected to other people's lives. Because we were all created in a community that was very um, tight-knit um, uh, back uh, before in that pre-Amazon era. Um, so, um, that's really how the, the process got started was, uh, through this, uh, kind of, uh, prod of realizing that, uh, our time is limited here and also realizing that I had a strong connection to this place and a strong connection to the community that, that was now becoming, um, much more um, dispersed. Mm -hmm. um, one of the the threads that kind of runs through both the book and also your your work and career is this this idea of kind of um, challenging the idea of whose stories matter and whose stories should be told, um, both in journalism and also in, um, in 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 the walls inside the walls of a museum. And can you talk about your approach to that and um, and how that kind of shows up in the book as well? I grew up uh, 
a fairly modest, uh, uh, with very modest upbringing. My father came here as a, as a laborer, worked in the Alaska canneries, uh, lived in the Chinatown International District, and, uh, uh, and then my both my father and mother were immigrants as well. My father worked in a top suey restaurant called the Hong Kong Restaurant uh, for quite a number of years. Uh, my mother worked in a sewing factory, um, but uh, growing up, you know, I was surrounded by all these people who were a part of my life. But I never saw them in history books. I never saw anything written about uh, Chinese waiters uh, or sewing factory workers, even though my whole life was surrounded by all these folks who this is what they did. Um, so from fairly early on, I, I realized, well, geez, these are things that, these are the stories that matter to me. I don't see them anywhere, but you know, if I'm gonna become a writer, these are the things I wanna write about. Um, I remember when I was uh, bussing tables at the restaurant, because that's what I did to earn me to go to college. And the first college educated generation in my family, we were like two or three generations. Um, <clears throat> I remember listening to the waiters talk, you know, about and it was fascinating to hear them talk about the old days, but then also to realize that uh, many of, were, of them were here illegally because of the Chinese exclusion law. And many of them had wives in China that they couldn't bring here because of the laws. And so it was, you know, wanting to, to write about some of those things. My mother worked as a sewing woman for many years. It was a hard life. Uh, but, you know, she's the one that gave us um, what helped put food on the table. And so for them not to even exist uh, in our history, historical record, to me seemed like it was really wrong. So um, I was in that generation, very idealistic generation, civil rights era, the 70s. Um, and you know, Naomi, that was your father's generation. Um, we wanted to create change and we wanted to um, uh, create some new voices and so that's um, that's that's what led me to to my career path i think it was interesting though to see when you when you did that work in journalism in writing you told those stories through the examiner and the other places that you wrote and then when you started working in museums it seems like you kind of encountered some of the similar resistance but in this case it was like well that's doesn't belong in a museum. You know, art, fancy Asian art belongs in a museum, not the story of a garment worker, right? And so you had to push through some of that resistance as well. Yeah, this, the, so I, I joined the Wing Luke Museum in uh, 1991 as uh, uh, executive director without really any museum background. Um, so I, I came to it fairly fresh, of course, with the journalism background. And so I was interested in, displaying stories, not necessarily objects and artifacts. Uh, those would provide more uh, a visual context. But I was interested in the core of the stories, the oral histories, and making that the centerpiece of the museum. Uh, I was also interested in bringing community elders and student activists and community leaders into the process of creating these exhibits. And when I initially entered the field, people thought I was a little bit of a, a nut because you said, no, no, no. I mean, at that juncture, you know, museums are built around the objects, the collection, the physical collection, and not oral histories. They were really more an afterthought for ever used. Um, and they weren't focused on exhibits that looked at topics and issues here and now. They were always looking backwards at uh, reconstructing something from the past and not seeing the connection to so how is this relevant to today and here and now. So I think that was the fundamental change that I injected into uh, profession is this notion that of community created exhibits based on oral histories as a centerpiece and not objects, uh, and not looking at museums as simply um, um, static uh, sort of uh, omnipotent uh, voices 
uh, from afar, but actually voices from that, that are intimate and that um, that really truly represent uh, people who um, uh, bear the history and bear the uh, stories that that um, really should be why people go to museums. Did the does the did the professional originally the professional museum executives who were skeptical at first? Did you ever talk to them later and find out what they thought about thought about it after you actually had done it? Um, well, at different junctures, I mean, a lot of them I should say were, were very open and helpful um, as I began this journey, but they they just didn't see this other way as being a way that uh, could be effectively um, instituted. So, for example, when I presented this idea of, you know, a community organizing model infused into a museum, um, often the idea was, well, uh, how are you going to create some kind of cohesive um, um, presentation? Because the content and the visual stuff, I mean, you're bringing these folks without credentials that they're not museum specialists or experts you can have chaos. Um, but having worked in the community setting, I knew that, you know, you could create stuff of uh, aesthetic quality of, you know, legitimate with legitimate content. Um, but it's working through the process. So they just weren't used to the process. You're used to hiring a subject expert on something and you bring them in and they curate the exhibit. Yeah. I was talking about community curated exhibits, which um, oftentimes may depend on community elders or other voices that really were never brought into the museum, but um, were equally valid um, and um, created oftentimes much more powerful stories than folks you know, once they removed. And I'll just I'll just quote you um, from the book um, on this point um, in the book, you say museum professionals would do well to remind themselves that what they do is neither so arcane, neither so arcane or so sacrosanct that ordinary people can't be lead participants. Yeah. I, I just, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a funny story that I'll share. Um, we were creating an exhibit on the Japanese incarceration. Um, connected with the 50 year anniversary of um, Executive Order 9066. And it was, it was my first stab at a community curated exhibit. So I gathered a bunch of folks I'd worked with at the International Examiner, other community folks, uh, like the Nisei um, uh, and Sansei, some Yonsei and some Issei actually. Um, anyway, I said, well, hey, let's create an exhibit, you know? Got nothing to lose because at the time when I was hired, there was no money. The museum was actually going broke. And so they said, Well, how, how the heck do we do this, Riley? And I said, Well, do you think I know? Let's just, you know, let's figure it out. We've got, you know, the stakes are kind of high, but then the, the expectations are very low. At one low point, um, one of the uh, uh, committee members um, was fretting about. Um, you know, whether they could pull it off. And uh, I mentioned uh, this person named Sally. I said, well, really think about what's an, what's an exhibit? I mean, you stick some pictures up on the wall and, you know, what's what's the big deal? And everyone was so stressed out. My comment just made everybody laugh, you know, because they started thinking about it. And it's like, well, I guess maybe we could do it. Um, but oftentimes, you know, there's these somehow, again, as you quoted me, you know, people think, you know, I mean, you know, anybody could do an exhibit. I mean, I'm not trying to minimize, you know, uh, the, you know, the value of experience as you develop, you know, that expertise. But, you know, I mean, I, I didn't have any museum experience and I was able to do some things. Sometimes stuff better to go in without preconceptions. You can't do anything. Um, because otherwise, you talk yourself out of doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know anything about museums either, but I um, worked a little bit with the folks who put together the Asian American Women Activists exhibit, which happened right before COVID at the Wing Luke. And 
and it really struck me through that process that it was so much like journalism, you know? Yeah. It's like research, you know, finding subject matter experts to mm -hmm. interview, collecting visuals to go along with it. It was a very similar process. And I was like, oh, I could totally see like how you could make that transition, you know? Well, and that, you know, people often ask, well, God, you, you had a very strange kind of progression from, you know, journalism to museums. And of course, now I'm in healthcare, but I mentioned that a lot of this is all the same stuff particularly as it relates to the transition from um, journalism to museums, um, you know, it's really about the same thing, gathering people's stories, offering perspective, um, um, you know, uh, present it in a way that the public can grasp and be moved by and come to understand an issue. It's, it's very, very basic. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to take a minute to remind the audience that um, you can start putting your questions in at the bottom. Um, I can see those when you um, put them in and then I can kind of help try to or sort them out and folks can also upvote them um, once they're written. So please um, do that as we go along and not at the very last second because it'll be easier for me to kind of sort them out um, as we as we keep talking. Um, Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your experience um, at the UW Daily and the discrimination complaint you filed. And just kind of reflecting back on that time, um, it, well, talk about that a little bit, but then also talk about kind of the ripple effect it had in your career and whether or not if, if you could have, you know, done it over again, um, if you would have wanted to, you know, work in mainstream media or something like that, or if, if that's, wasn't something that you were wanting to do. Yeah. Um, when I uh, attended the University of Washington, I um, decided to major in editorial journalism and pursued a communications uh, degree. I began working at the University of Washington Daily as a reporter. And after doing um, quite a few stories, um, news stories, I decided, well, I want to become a news editor. I applied for the position, but the way the system was set up, um, the editor basically hires who the editor in chief hires whoever they want, and uh, so um, I felt that that wasn't right. Uh, and in particular, I applied for the position, and the job is actually offered to um, a number of other folks who hadn't applied for the position, all of whom were white, and so I filed a uh, discrimination complaint with the uh, staff office of human rights. Um, it was a two year battle, um, which basically resulted, I mean, I, I won, but um, the, the fallout was I didn't get my degree. So I left the university without uh, a communications degree. I couldn't get a job, I applied. So um, a number of places, city, county, for, for writing kind of positions. Um, my, pos my complaint had uh, been covered at length uh, in the media. So I was labeled as someone who was challenging First Amendment right of the press to do you know, what they want to do. Um, so I left without a degree and then I came back down to the community because I had been bussing tables uh, in the restaurant uh, for a number of years. And I did that, did some community odd jobs. Um, I um, joined the International Examiner newspaper, a community newspaper that had just started up uh, and began working there and just stayed in the community. Um, uh, pursuing my love of journalism there. Never made any money because like a lot of these community papers at that time, and I'm sure you know how that is, you know, we do it for the love of the work and not just making money. So, um, so I, you know, I stayed um, in the community for years and years. I never actually even spoke about my community, my discrimination like, for years and years as well. So I didn't want to backwards. Um, it was in the writing of the memoir that um, a friend of mine reviewed the manuscript and said, hey, Ron, I, I like this 
book, but there's a chapter that you don't even talk about how you even feel about what happened. And to me, this is like a highlight. I mean, it's a turning point. And I said, so what do you want me to do? He says, well, why don't you write about it? How, how did you feel? And, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't conscious of it. So I had to go back, and that was the toughest chapter that um, I ever had to write because uh, I'd never confronted that. I just pushed it somehow in the back of my brain. Um, and so, so it kind of liberated me in some ways. Um, so, so I'm grateful for that opportunity. But, um, you know, in terms of, I mean, it did take me down to the community. I don't know if I would have ended up down there um, uh, regardless, just because of my connections to the community and what was happening during that uh, civil rights era. But, um, you know, it gave me a sense of uh, purpose of being there. Uh, perhaps the memoir, and I think about it now, Naomi, maybe, maybe it's the launching of this career I never had that I wanted to have. Um, you know, if I've got a few more years, I'd love to do some more writing. Um, because, and you know this too, Naomi, you know, when you're running your magazine, you know, I mean, you're at a publication, but you, do you really write? You know, I mean, you're busy, you know, selling ads, and, you know, editing stuff, and doing layouts and raising money and stuff. So, um, you know, I'm hopeful that this uh, will launch me on a perhaps a new journey. That's great. Um, and thank you to the folks that are adding questions. I I appreciate that here for me. Um, and I, I saw a ton of journalists on this attendance list earlier. So I know there's other questions that are coming. So put them in there. Um, uh, one of the one of the kind of vignettes that you open with is um, going for a run um, recently on Beacon Hill and just observing some of the changes that have taken place and and some of the ways in which you don't really recognize um, recognize Seattle in some ways. Um, can you talk about what what you think might be lost or what younger generations might be not understanding about you know what we need to protect and take care of in order to have the kind of Seattle that you know, you, you were, you've always been such a big part of. Yeah, boy, the, the pace of change has been really, um, kind of, um, unfathomable, um, you know, that pre Amazon development era, it was really more a small town. And I tried to describe some of that, uh, in that era I grew up in where, you know, you essentially knew everybody um in the neighborhoods now it wasn't an ideal world so very segregated as well but it was a sense of comfort and having that um level of intimacy uh i think the loss of intimacy and just the, the pace um to me is troubling um we often tend to forget uh our history and tend to forget that sometimes uh, uh creating social change um requires um, an extended effort and then to build on you know, the efforts of those who came before us but of course if you don't know who came before you and how you build on it so i was hoping to fill some pieces of the void there um i was also trying to i think show that uh, change is possible and has happened we still have a hell of a long way to go but uh you know, i'm you know i was inspired by the efforts of Larry Gossett and Berta Maestas and Bob Santos and Bernie White there, uh, uh, Irie Scott and others. And so I write uh, about them as well and the ways that they inspired me. But, but it's not simply those folks who are the frontline folks. There are some other folks who never have been acknowledged in our history. I read about Ruth Ann Carose and Karen Saraguchi, two champions of the redress movement. We forget that uh, there's some folks on the ground who are doing a lot of the hard work. And, you know, they never get acknowledged. You hear about uh, uh, Normanetta or uh, Serta Noe or, uh, you know, 
other folks at a higher level. Uh, even Michael Lowry, who introduced the first redress uh, bill, you hear about those folks. But folks behind the scenes, you, don't, you just don't hear about. So I wanted to write about them. I wrote about some of the folks I work with at the Hong Kong restaurant. There's a whole chapter on the waiters. Because, um, you know, I remember during the time I was working uh, at the University of Washington da Daily and attending the University of Washington Daily, I was working at the restaurant too. Funny thing is, you know, I go uh, and work at the restaurant, change into my school uniform, I do my work. And I remember serving some of the folks who were students with me and they didn't recognize me. I mean, they didn't, they literally, you become faceless. In this restaurant, you just become faceless. Mm. To me, it just sort of, you know, how is this possible? You know, and then I just, there's little things that just, uh, and then working at the restaurant, um, it was really troubling because I saw how my father was treated. Um, generally, most of the customers were respectful because you develop relationships with them and they asked for him by name and they left him pretty tips. Um, but, uh, you know, I also saw, you know, folks uh, call him boy. I heard, you know, just sort of, you know, the way they treated some of the folks, just, you know, it, it really upset me. And so I think coupled with my attending University of Washington, just sort of being in the midst of seeing Selma Domingo, Jean Viernes, some of the Canary Union activists fighting for change and then um, seeing what was happening um, in my own life, you know, just, you know, I felt like my, my personnel was fractured. I was living in many different worlds at the same time, being the child of illegal immigrant uh, because of the Chinese exclusion law, it, you know, we were kind of laying low and they didn't, my parents didn't share a lot of the history set so kind of piece it together and drag it out of them. But, um, and then you're in this progressive environment, it's all the social change happening and so forth. So I felt really fractured and trying to come to understand and piece it all together was probably the biggest challenge for me during those those years. But um, you know, that's why I became a journalist. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so we have some really great questions and audience, if, if you don't see me getting to these in order, it's because I'm gonna reorganize them um, just for the flow of the conversation. Um, um, so I think I, I think the first question I want to ask um, is um, let's see. The first question I want to ask is what were some of the hurdles that you faced um, getting um, a diverse Asian American community to support the museum and all the different you know groups that are encompassing that. Yeah, that was um, that was a hard campaign. It was a twenty-five, uh, twenty-three million dollar campaign, twenty-three point two million dollar campaign. I initially had proposed uh, the idea of a thirty million dollar campaign. My board thought I was nuts. Um, they authorized a twenty-three point two million dollar campaign. In truth, I knew they weren't going to go with thirty, but I'll settle for twenty-three. Because at the time we were only a half million dollar operation, and so we said, "You're so nuts. There's no way we can raise this money." Um, but you know, I had faith um, because we had developed good relationships with um, folks we worked with on these community-based, uh, community organizing uh, exhibits. When we did our Japanese incarceration exhibit, uh, the community helped us raise. Um, more than the entire budget of the museum, which at the time was 125,000 or something like that. And we raised 150,000. They helped save the museum. Um, and they were there in our corner. They wanted this story of what happened during World War II to be shared with future generations. And I made a promise. I said, we're going to build this new institution and this will be a core exhibit. Um, and 
by the time the museum had opened, I mean, most of the Nisei were gone. But, you know, I remember what they contributed to the institution. And I had faith that uh, they would carry it, help carry us over the finish line. In the same way, you know, we had built relationships with the uh, Sikh community, with the Chinese American community through a Chinese oral history project I had done, and many, many other communities. And I felt if we can piece those constituencies together, then we have enough of a basis to raise the money to make this happen. Now, a capital campaign is always a, a leap of faith, but um, I felt that it was worth trying. And I, I've always been one to not shy away from challenges. I felt, well, if it's worth doing, um, then it's worth doing. And if you fail, uh, you know, you don't really fail, you achieve whatever was achievable. And that's not a failure. It also struck me that, you know, a big part of the the burden of that capital campaign was was really proof of concept of something that hadn't ever been done before. So in uh, since that success, have have there been other types of efforts like that in other parts of the country to create culturally specific museums? Yeah, like that? yeah um, to a certain extent, um, the Wing Museum is kind of unique in, in terms of its Pan-Asian, Pacific Islander um, kind of framework, but other ethnic specific institutions have made efforts to, to do similar kind of um, diverse um, uh, institution building. Um, it's really what slice you want to um, uh, tackle. Um, it's a very hard work, I'll say that. Um, because it does require uh, an ability to develop relationships that matter. So, you know, it, I've seen a lot of mainstream institutions, for example, they, you know, they create these uh, minority advisory committees and so forth. And they're not really tasked with real decision making powers. I felt that the key was really letting people in from the ground from the beginning phase, uh, to let them help in the decision making, to let them help chart the course, then people are invested. So um, when we did that with our exhibits and with the planning of the new um, museum, you know, people really felt, well, hey, this is a bonds project. This is our project. You know, we don't want this thing to fail. Um, it's not about letting Ron dangle out there in the middle of nowhere with that um, you know, a life raft, it's like we're all in this together. So, you know, these collective efforts have incredible power and it's museums uh, untethering themselves from this notion that it's this hierarchical thing when you organize. Uh, I had the privilege of, uh, when I was at the museum, being able to travel a little bit to uh, some other institutions around the country based in needs of color, you know, arts institutions, um, um, uh, community centers, um, other small museums, and I saw amazing things happening. But again, you don't really hear about, um, and I drew inspiration from the work that was happening in those places as well. That's great. Um, so next question is, um, what do you see as the biggest change in the international district pre-1980 and the biggest change since? And that's from Stan Shikuma. Oh boy. Uh, you know, the more the things, things change, the more they stay the same in some respects. We still have incredible issues of poverty. Um, um, you have um, equity issues, you have, you know, uh, all the, um, um, you know, health related issues, uh, um, you know, uh, just a whole range of stuff. That was present, you know, we had these rundown hotels, 
uh, without uh, electricity and um, refrigeration and so forth um, in that early era in which I experienced um, uh, the community, um, you, you still have issues of you know pretty intense poverty um, uh, in the core of that neighborhood. Um, business failures, uh, we had lots of them, we still have lots of them, and in this COVID-19 era, obviously, you know, a lot of the business community is shut down, and um, you know, how does it re reopen? I mean, I think there's, a, there's an incredible sense of uncertainty right now. You know, the, um, some of the um, Chinese virus, China virus, Wuhan virus stuff doesn't certainly help. You know, it's created this xenophobic um, uh, overlay. Uh, but I would say, you know, we've ma made a few steps forward. Uh, we've got some new facilities that um, and buildings have been built, um, uh, an additional layer of social services. But, you know, we had a fire that leveled, uh, you know, a major uh, building in the district. We have many places boarded up. People can't open the restaurants, people are, you know, hurting financially. So um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Thanks. Um, there's a question about mainstream media. Um, can the person who asked that question um, c create a new question that sort of clarifies, um, clarifies the question a little bit so I can ask that one? Um, and following up on the museum question, um, what do you see as the core value of the museum that anchors it as a valuable part of the city of Seattle? Boy, it's probably a question that should be asked of Beth Takakawa and Cassie Chin and the gang there now. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's rooted in a neighborhood that uh, is one of the most important historic neighborhoods in the city. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, it represents an incredible uh, diversity uh, and, and a model of how different ethnic groups have been able to come together and, uh, and coexist. That's why we have this unique neighborhood called the International District. Um, so, um, I tried not to answer questions representing the museum anymore because, you know, a past director should not be doing that. It's just a matter of protocol. It's like the president. You're not supposed to. Exactly. Two yeah. presidents. Um, <laughs> um, so the next question is, um, as a longtime Seattleite who's seen a lot of big changes, um, are there ways that you'd like to see newcomers give back to the city? Um, um, I'd say plug into um, some of the existing networks and uh, organizations that have been around for many years. You know, I worry about um, uh, a lot of, we're in the midst also of this generational shift, uh, as you know. Um, the baby boomers of my generation were retiring and passing away. Um, so a lot of the uh, social justice organizations and nonprofit social service ag agencies, advocacy groups are really in need of new leadership. So I'd say the best way to contribute really is to um, um, seek out some of these groups and start volunteering, serve on boards and, and uh, you know, check out um, what's been around because you always I've always felt it's better to resurrect an organization and to work with something that's already built rather than create a new one. This takes a long time to you know, get established. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember you and I talked and I talked once about um, about this a little bit, and 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 I you you had also said that it was important that. Um, younger generations and the newcomers like took the time to learn the history of when, what went before as well. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, books like yours really help lay that foundation um, for a new generation as well. 
Um, so I'm going to try to tackle this question. I wasn't entirely sure um, how to ask. Um, it, uh, it says, um, it's talking about efforts to get a position in mainstream media. I think there might have been a misunderstanding around the UW Daily, um, the UW Daily discrimination complaint. But the question is, how do you interpret being Chinese American affecting your not being selected for those jobs? Um, um, well, just in the context of my particular situation, um, I, I, you know, I can't say with any certainty why I wasn't hired for the job that I applied for at the UW Daily. Um, I just knew I wasn't interviewed for the job and the job had been offered to at least four or five other individuals who had not applied for the position, all of whom were white. And so there was something screwy with the process, um, which is why I filed the complaint. Uh, and then um, the human rights investigation found that absent um, job descriptions, uh, process of interviews, um, affirmative action, hiring, firing guidelines, all the basic stuff. Um, it set up a situation where discrimination occurred. And so um, uh, after two years, they offered me a settlement and instituted those basic measures. But by that time, again, I had been um, labeled a troublemaker. Uh, I couldn't get my degree. The, the odd thing, or wasn't odd, but one of the barriers was um, at the time, so I couldn't get a job, but uh, so I went and began volunteering at the International Examiner newspaper. Um, the credits I needed to get my degree uh, were reporting, uh, uh, was a reporting requirement. So I could go and volunteer at a shopping news or one of the designated uh, approved newspapers and get those credits and get my degree. But even though I was editor of the International Examiner, because it wasn't on that list of approved publications, I couldn't uh, get those credits, which would then allow me to get my degree. So I left rather than leave the examiner. Um, and I never looked back. I said, well, I'm not leaving the examiner because I found a home there. So, um, but then where would I go? You see, because nobody was going to hire me. I could volunteer at one of the weekly neighborhood publications or a shopping news. There were literally some shopping news publications that I could volunteer for that were on the list, but I couldn't finish my, and get my degree. Uh, and then meanwhile, things were getting kind of hot. Uh, there were some professors at this communication school who talked about my discrimination complaint, uh, uh, threatening the uh, First Amendment and, and you know, I remember when I filed the complaint, I was 20 years old. So, you know, I just needed to get out of there. My mother was deathly afraid that somebody was going to attack me. And I was getting some hate calls on the phone. Because back then, everyone's number is in the phone book, right? And so, you know, it was, you know, um, there weren't a lot of paths out. So that's, that's kind of happened there. Um, so we're getting to our last few questions. If anyone has any extra questions, um, put them in the question box now. Um, do you have a favorite story from your book? A favorite story? Um, probably my, well, there's two favorites, uh, and they've both been reprinted. The chapters have been reprinted in the International Examiner newspaper, so you can actually go online and read them for free. But, um, one chapter is about my mother's efforts to learn English. Um, she was a sewing woman and um, she um, decided after she retired, she wanted to learn English because she wanted her children to respect her and she wanted to understand 
uh, be understood when she went to shopping. Um, so she um, spent, uh, she, she attended a course at Seattle Central College. Uh, she was the oldest student there. Um, uh, and I came over, uh, you know, practically three, four times a week to help her with her English lessons. She had her Chinese English dictionary, big magnifying glass, and she'd watch uh, Tammy uh, and Jim, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker on TV to write down words, you know, because the way they enunciated and repeated words, it gave her an opportunity to copy things down, you see. Um, so I came over and helped her with her English lessons. Um, you have to read it, but it, it's kind of funny because of her attempts at trying to capture the English sounds were um, uh, not always successful. And then, you know, a lot of these um, American idioms, you know, bring home the ba bacon and, you know, uh, things like that it just confused her. And so trying to explain things, it just it was a, you know, I was inspired by her, her efforts. Um, the other favorite chapter is going back to um, uh, writing about going back to my father's home village, uh, which is located in uh, the Toysan district. Um, and this happened in 2008, I brought my kids, my sister brought her kids as well. And it was a very moving experience because um, I felt like I sort of reclaimed a piece of, uh, of my mother, especially both my parents, um, because those stories started flooding back to me and it felt sort of at home, uh, even though, I mean, it was home, but it wasn't home, but I understood who I was in that moment of clarity when you, you arrive at a place that seems so familiar and that the people uh, eerily sort of look like you, the way they walk, it just subtle little things. Um, so um, yeah, those would be my two favorites. Wow, we're getting some really great questions. So um, uh, thank you all for the questions. Um, I'm gonna try to, we're, let's try to work through these next questions um, fairly quickly. Um, the next one is um, from Binko and John, who I read about in your book, so I know who they are. Um, and their question is, what is your ideal vision for how this Chinatown International District should develop and evolve as we move forward? There's no roadmap, but we want to be a part of preserving and celebrating the CID. There's so many pressures to develop the CID. I think um, John and Binko are doing the right thing. They, they've taken a community institution, a uh, you know, one of those five 10 cent uh, stores from an earlier era, and they've made it um, an incredible space respecting the history of the architecture and uh, creating a little mini museum in the space and then selling stuff that really connects with, uh, you know, uh, this uh, current generation. So it's uh, repurposing spaces that um, have meaning. Great. Um... And if you could create anything today for the community to bring it together, what would you create? I don't think there's any one kind of thing, Naomi. I think it's really, um, um, you know, sharing the history, whether as mentors or informally or through memoirs like this, um, letting people understand context it doesn't have to be a memoir. It could be there's other media formats that are less than 700 pages. Um, but I think that that really would be, um, you know, an appropriate vehicle. Um, so paraphrasing you, um, our history is what we acknowledge and disclose. Um, what story are you most proud of in your community work that we might not know about and is there a history that might that may not have been acknowledged? Um, one thing that I did um, in the book, there's been a lot of controversy of late about whether there was a Manila town or a Filipino presence in the Chinatown International District area. And, um, you know, 
I remember it. I remember all the Filipino old timers and the cafes and shops and so forth. Uh, I think that needs to be acknowledged. There used to be a huge African-American presence um, all up and down Jackson Street and even houses on Waller Street. You know, people don't remember that. So it's a very diverse community. I think, you know, in this, uh, you know, attempt to, uh, you know, kind of uh, be ethnocentric is how I put it. You know, we tend to forget that, well, you know, things evolve and we're all kind of connected going at the hip. Um, and these are going to be our last two questions. Um, what what year was your complaint at UW, and have they given you a degree to make up for you uh, make up for not getting your degree in a timely manner? Which I'll say that is in the book. If you read the book, you'll yeah. know this answer. Yeah. yeah, it's in the book, and yeah, you got to go read the book. It was I, mean, it's, I think thirty some years later. Um, it was actually um, uh, uh, one of Wing Luke's nieces who worked up at the UW who was also uh, working for a brief time at the Wing Luke Museum. She realized, along with her aunt Betty, you know, Wing's sister, that I didn't have a degree. And I, they said, huh, you know, they wanted to nominate me for alumni alumnus award. And I said, no, I can't. don't nominate me. And they said, how come? Because I don't have a degree. And they were shocked. And I, I didn't really want to talk about it. Again, that was that chapter I didn't really want to talk about in my life. And, so they went ahead and arranged for me to get my degree. So uh, yeah, I um, many years later was able to get my BA. That's great. Um, and last but not least, um, what do you want to do next? Well, uh, I'm currently raising money for an aging in place facility on North Beacon Hill. And um, Hoping to finish up that fundraising, you know, particularly in this COVID-19 era, we're starting to realize that people um, um, would rather, um, ha would like to have options to being institutionalized when they become more frail. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping to finish that up in the next few years. And then I want to write. That's my last goal, is to write a writer. Um, yeah, thank you both so much. Um, this has been really great. We kind of, uh, we love being able to put on um, programs that are super local like this and there's such a rich history. Um, thanks so much, Ron, for all of your, uh, your research. And I mean, such a, um, such a detailed and broad history of the, of the, um, of the community, I think is, really astounding and congratulations on, on finishing it and um, getting it out into the into the world. Um, and thank you, Naomi. Um, great job. And it's really great to hear your experiences as well. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, everybody, so much for watching.